So good morning, everyone. So um, last week, Mui gave a talk on the sixth patriarch, Wei Ming. Uh, and today I will be talking about his Dharma grandson, Matsu, who lived between 709 and 788 CE. And um, I have to say that this has been really enjoyable listening to these ancestor talks. And I also appreciated the opportunity to learn about Master Ma and I look forward to learning more about him and all the teachers of our lineage. Um, I'm additionally interested in learning more about our matriarchs and investigating the lives and koans that feature their influence on our practice. You know, many people have contributed to our life and practice and many of these individuals, we will never know their influence, though it is felt so I really appreciate being able to get to know those that I can. And um, as a disclaimer, what I'm about to share about Matsu barely scratches the surface of what has been written about him. Um, I wasn't familiar with him or his influence until tasked with researching him. So um, this might be a short talk, but I hope it helps with seeing some of his contributions to Zen. So according to the many resources I investigated for this talk, um, almost all current Zen lineages in China, Japan, and Korea can trace their ancestry through Matsu. And this really isn't surprising in some ways because it was said that he had many students. Um, in fact, he's had thousands of students and somewhere around 139 Dharma successors. Uh, among these Dharma successors were Yakujo and Nansen, who um, we will be hearing about actually in the next two weeks. Uh, Matsu lived during what is considered the Golden Age of Zen, which spanned 618 to 906 CE during the Tang Dynasty. And while this time was marked by fresh and innovative approaches to Chinese Chan that helped form Zen into what it is today, including the significant influence that Matsu had in shaping our Zen, the time was also marked with growing political instability famine, military operations, riots, and disease. Between 754 and 764, about 36 million Chinese had died. That was two thirds of the entire population of China in the span of 10 years. This upheaval and massive loss of life took place in the middle of Matsu's life during his training and his teachings. And it is during this difficult time that Zen flourished and that while, <clears throat> while our lives are much more comfortable today than they were then, it is instructive to see, instructive to see how even amid great difficulty or even perhaps because of it, there can be great awakening. This, um, in looking at this um, and reading about it, it really brought me a lot of solace and really resolved to practice as we move through pandemic, wars, unstable government, unrest, and environmental degradation. So Matsu was said to have left home at 15 He was dissatisfied with what the world seemed to offer. Um, and by 20, he was already an ordained monk. 
He was known to be a strong and relentless meditator and had studied with a few teachers until he met his final teacher, Master Nangaku Ejo, who was Wei Ning's first Dharma heir. And there's a legend that Wei Ning, um, at the time of him passing um, the lamp on to Nangaku, had told Nangaku about a prophecy made by the 27th Indian patriarch, Prajnatara, that under your feet will come forth a spirited young horse who will trample the whole world. Could this be a prediction about Matsu? After all, he was Nangaku's only Dharma successor and certainly made his mark. Um, I think uh, his physicality is uh, particularly enjoyable because it's discussed almost in everything that, um, that is written about him that I could find. Um, Matsu was physically described as having penetrating eyes like a tiger's and walk like bull, like a bull, that he could stretch his tongue over his nose and his, the soles of his feet had the marks of wheels. So one day this bull was sitting Zazen and his teacher Nangaku took notice and asked him, what do you wish to achieve sitting as you do? I wish to attain Buddhahood, said Matsu. Nangaku then picked up a tile and began to polish it. Matsu asked, Master, what are you doing? Nangaku said, I'm polishing this tile into a mirror. Nangaku simply, <clears throat> oh, sorry, um, perplexed, Matsu asked, but teacher, how can you hope to polish a tile into a mirror? Nangaku simply replied, how can you make a Buddha by sitting in meditation? At this remark and a few more that followed, Matsu's transactional and dualistic notions dissolved and he awakened to his Buddha nature. He never stopped sitting, but he wasn't confused about becoming either. Matsu studied with his teacher, deepening his practice and understanding for 10 more years before receiving Dharma transmission and striking out on his own as a teacher in his own right. Matsu then traveled for 20 years all over China until settling in the South where he taught for more than 10 years before his death. His teaching methods were unorthodox and two of Matsu's approaches highly influenced Zen in the years that followed. The first of some of these methods he used to meet immediacy of the moment. Um, these training techniques included shouting, kicking, pinching, wordless gestures with the fly whisk, so that now ceremonially a lot of Zen teachers have that stick with the fluffy, fluffy thing at the end. Blows with the stick, so the kaiosaku and the shipe, and just plain knocking over his pupils anything to move his students to insight. In effect, these techniques were antecedents to Master Rinzai, his Dharma great-grandson, and highly influenced that school. So here's an example of Matsu's teaching. A monk had his first meeting with Matsu. The monk asked, what is the meaning of Zen? Matsu said, bow down and I will tell you. As the student began to bow, Matsu kicked the monk over. The monk had a great awakening and rose laughing. Later he told the assembly, since the day I was kicked by Master Ma, I have not stopped laughing. 
Another example um, is uh, on a walk with uh, Yak Joe. They observed some wild ducks flying by and Matsu said, what is that? And Yako Joe said, wild ducks. Master Ma said, where have they flown to? Yako Joe replied, they flew away. Thereupon, Matsu pinched the end of Yako Joe's nose so hard, Yako Joe cried out in pain. Then the great master said to Yako Joe, why didn't they fly away? Another major contribution of Matsu to Zen is, um, was his one-to-one face-to-face meetings with his students, which really um, was a precursor to the Daisan and Dokusan used in Zen training to this day. And then while Matsu is known for dramatic and urgent methods to help his students awaken, one of the most profound and beautiful contributions is his teaching that ordinary mind is the way. This teaching that true mind is none other than ordinary mind, that this very life is Buddha, is Matsu's central teaching. And according to Janet Jiryu Abel, Matsu's teachings were founded on the Tathagata Garbha doctrine that all beings are endowed with Buddha nature or mind ground, but that it is concealed by false views and conditioning. Uh, She writes that this mind ground functions not in the world, but as the world. And it is this functioning that is the heart of Matsu's teaching. So is it any wonder that a kick, a pinch, or even just a statement was just Matsu pointing the way? Matsu called these actions of ordinary life, eating, sitting, walking, confusion, laughter, ordinary mind. Once Matsu was questioned by someone who didn't understand what he meant by ordinary mind. What was the ordinary mind? Matsu responded that it was the very mind that didn't understand that was ordinary mind. This teaching of ordinary mind is echoed in Matsu's favorite student Nansen who said that the Tao is nothing but the ordinary life. Likewise, we see his inspiration in his student Layman Pong's Gatha. In my daily life, there are no other chores than those that happen to fall into my hands. Nothing I choose, nothing I reject. Nowhere is there a do. Nowhere a slip. I have no other emblems of my glory than the mountains and hills without a speck of dust. My magical power and spiritual exercise consist in carrying water and gathering firewood. In his online writing on lineage, um, Alastair Gordon Finlayson argues that Matsu's effect on later ideas, such as original enlightenment and Dogen's practice realization, saying that these flow from this early and radical expression of enlightenment as something that's totally within our reach right now. This ordinary mind, this day-to-day mind, this regular mind. A monk once asked Matsu, what is Buddha? Matsu answered, mind is Buddha. In Mumon's poem on this koan, he writes, 
A fine day under the blue sky. Don't foolishly look here and there. If you still ask, what is Buddha? It is like pleading your innocence while clutching the stolen goods. In the year 788, Matsu became ill. The monastery superintendent asked, Ma <clears throat> asked him, Master, how's your health these days? Great Master Ma replied, Sun-faced Buddha, Moon-faced Buddha. Shortly after, Ma uh, Master Matsu died. But his teaching lives on and in us. Just as all the ancestors, those we know and those we don't. So I wanted to mention that um, in preparation for this talk that um, I referred to Janet Abel's book, Making Zen Your Own, and then several different koan books, um, the Encyclopedia of Eastern Philosophy and Religion, online discourses, and the notes that Roshi shared with me. So in the spirit of these teachers and teachings, I would like to thank all teachers past, present, and future in all their various forms. And I wanna particularly thank Roshi for his help. So thank you all for being here.